Hello and happy Friday. How are you? Ooh, it's a little chilly out there. Can't say the sun is shining today, but I am here in Chicago and thankful to be here with you today. I'm Sadia Davis, the director for the Center for Creative Entrepreneurship. And as some of you know, uh, we are the nonprofit arm of 2112, the largest creative co-working space and largest creative incubator in the world. And I love to say that because I think it's important for people to really start to lock it in and what that means. And with the CCE, we represent nine industries of the creative arts. So when you have an opportunity, check us out online at Center for Creative Entrepreneurship. It's cce.global.whatever.org. <laughs> All these things, right? But um, before we get started with our guest today, I just want to you know, really encourage any of our artists out there to continue to send us information or questions regarding what can we do to help inspire you? What can we do to help motivate you in the work that you're doing, whether that's in film, music, video, fashion, culinary, uh, you name it. How can we provide information that would help your business uh, be sustainable and take it to the next level? Some of that is marketing. Some of that is law you know, having the proper contracts. You can do a great service to yourself and check out some of the educational videos that we've provided thus far on our CCE Global Center for Creative Entrepreneurship YouTube page. And you can also follow us on Instagram uh, at cce.global. So before we get started, I'm almost there, you guys. Hang tight with me. I'm really excited about next week, on uh, the 18th. We are taking a look into TunePad, which is a new technology developed out of Northwestern, um, developed by Mike Horn and his team that allows individuals to learn the coding behind making beats. So check us out next Friday at 2 p.m. for that. We are so grateful to have the Coleman Foundation as our generous sponsor and Arts Alliance Illinois as our fiscal sponsor. So today, let's go ahead and bring up Ron Wexler. Ron Wexler is the New Growth Partners Director of Business and Talent Development and oversees talent acquisition, playbooking, best practices, talent development, and business development initiatives. Prior to NGP, Wexler spent 12 years at Citadel in numerous capacities, most notably in macro research, fundraising, and talent development. McGraw, I can never say McGill University, uh, with an MA in economics and a Bachelor's of Arts in Industrial Relations. Ron, you know what? You are a economic strategist star. <laughs> Welcome. Thanks so much for having me, Sadia. It's great to see you again, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be here for installment number three. I know. Listen, thanks for making an investment of your time for the Center for Creative Entrepreneurship. You know, we started out leveling the playing field, right? Um, making sure people understood, like, at whatever level you are financially, maybe even not really having a lot to save, you know, what do we, what can we do with what we do have? We're in the middle of a pandemic, uh, but we're also in the creative art industries and so many of those industries have halted, right? So we thought it was a good idea to sort of wake up everybody's consciousness around money, <laughs> money, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I, I guess like the first, I guess, two sessions that we've done together was like, okay, there's, there's some complex things, but then there's some real simple things. And the simple things is how do we save a little bit each week? Mm -hmm. How do we live below our means? And how do we allocate capital to good ideas? Um, in, in the same way that a professional athlete has got coaches yeah. uh, and staff, we all should have coaches and staff as it pertains to managing our wealth. And so last week was pretty exciting. We had our dear friend, Mr. Uh, Richard Wu on and I'd like to think he helped demystify uh, what it's like to actually meet with a, a financial advisor, at least a very good one. I thought he did a really, really good job. He asked some really, really thoughtful questions. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think we got to the end, uh, you know, of the session, unfortunately, only scratching the surface because we never really kind of got to the uh, recommendation. But, um, you know, n now it's kind of like we should probably, I, you know, it's okay with you. Just a quick reminder of kind of what's at the buffet table, yeah. um, you know, for average people. And then, you know, continue the conversation of like, well, 
what if I'm not so average? What if I'm slightly above average and have a little bit more capital to deploy? What does that look like? What does that look like? I mean, you work hard, you've made some money and we're, you know, the markets keep going all over the place. Well, in that case, the other thing that I brought up is that we're talking to artists and entrepreneurs, right? And there are some directors, there are some uh, producers, right? Who've come up, meaning their income has shot up and they're making more money than maybe they ever did. Or the fact that maybe they didn't have financial literacy and now all of a sudden they're making money. What are the best options for them to do with their um, investments? So yeah, let's take it to the next level. And in doing so, we've invited on another friend and lovely Lori Crosley. Lori is a seasoned investment professional with over 20 years of go-to-market product and client channel strategy experience, consulting to and from within global organizations on sales, marketing, and product management. She is currently advising two startup companies, helping the founders to execute their strategy growth strategies and attract investors. With an MBA from Kellogg School of Management and a bachelor's degree in economics from Northwestern University, come on, Lori, let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I forgot to, to mention is I was actually on college week on the Wheel of Fortune, but I didn't win anything. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's awesome. That's pretty cool. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Lori, because, you know, we've been talking for the last couple of weeks and it's important for people to understand who you are. Yes, we just read your bio, but what motivates you and, and, and what are you interested in right now? Yeah. So, you know, my investment journey um, actually began with my career. Right. So when I got out of business school, some of my friends, um, some of my older friends, very successful, driving around expensive cars and living in fancy places. And um, I saw what they were doing uh, they were selling bonds. So I decided I wanted to get into the investment, uh, into the investment world. And so I've spent the last, um, you know, the last 20 years in investments and, and really helping other people to manage whether it is a pension plan, endowment or foundation, or their own private wealth. For me, it's always been, and I'm glad uh, you guys already had the conversation about uh, saving first. Uh, for me, it's always been paying yourself first. So even as an advisor, um, advising very wealthy people or uh, newly minted um, um, entrepreneurs who have come into stock or cash as a, as a uh, as a result of an acquisition or merger or family members who have uh, inherited money, um, you always have to sort of pay yourself first, right? And, um, you know, not living beyond your means falls into that category. Um, and so I look back at my career and, and my own personal development. And I think what I did do right throughout my career is I didn't live beyond my means. Um, you know, I still live in the same uh, loft that I bought out of business school 22 years ago. Um, I drive a 10 year old car <laughs> and I have very little debt. <laughs> yeah, I mean, thank you for mentioning that because it is literally one of the things that I think is the hardest thing to do when people, you know, are basically making enough to pay the bills but then spending more than they should be saving, right? And so we were talking about how do we shift our consciousness? How do we change our mind up a little right. bit? Yeah, um, I, actually, I actually read um, The Millionaire Next Door, and this is when I was a wealth advisor. And I, um, I met a family, their son was in uh, the draft, and I met them because I was listening to their conversation, and they said, wow, a million dollars, that's so much money. And so I, you know, as, as we do, Sadia, I interrupted their conversation, I introduced myself, and then I sent them a copy of that book, uh, because that really is what it's all about. Anybody can be a millionaire. Uh, it's not how much, it's not how you invest, it's how you save um, and how much you can, can put away. So um, now I'm at toward the end of my career. Um, I left my full-time job um, last year, as you know, to, to sort of spend time with my mom before she passed away. 
And now I get to do whatever I kind of want to do because I have the freedom um, to do that. And so just, um, just last year, I started making direct investments into private companies, um, mostly real estate and cannabis. Uh, and everybody, uh, you know, sort of is interested in the cannabis space. So I took it upon myself to really learn the business um, and start to look at what opportunities there are for seed and angel stage investors in the cannabis space, the legal cannabis space. Yeah. And this is what, so here's where I, okay, this is where I turn the conversation to, over to you and Ron, <laughs> because I know my lane. And I've brought experts to the table to talk about, you know, you know, where it's important to make investments. How do you track what's going on? I mean, cannabis, the cannabis business and the fact that Illinois is legal, um, that's one thing. But it's like, you know, how do you determine what's the right company to invest in? And here's where I'm going to turn it over to you to to really have that high level conversation about, you know, even like yourself having a sort of started your own company, but yet investing in other companies and what that looks like. And I know Ron is in private equity as well. So you guys have at it and I'll jump back in a little later. Well, I think just to kind of, as a starting point, I figured like, let's just a level set. So we do something really kind of very basic of like, just start with like, what are the vehicles out there? Right. So when we say private, what it, what exactly does that mean? Cause it, it means a lot of different things. And so, yeah. you know, just real basically, there's um, something called hedge funds. And to me, a hedge fund um, is like a car. You could say Ferrari and it means something. And you could say Honda and it means something. And there's all different kinds uh, of flavors. But, but just at 50,000 feet, and I used to work at Citadel, which is a really big, big, big hedge fund. Um, and, and the way we would explain it to investors is you would never buy a car that didn't have a steering wheel or brakes, right? And that's what a mutual fund is. That's what, when you buy a stock, yeah. it is essentially a car without a steering wheel or brakes. If the market goes up, pretty good chance you'll make money. If the market goes down, pretty, a hedge fund's designed, if they're doing their job properly, to make money in all markets, up, down. So when I was at Citadel, you know, we were, you know, every year it was up 15 to 20% with, minimal volatility and there are various flavors of hedge funds and so i you know i'd encourage people to look very carefully of like what are the fees what's the strategy what are the terms and so forth yeah. so that's like one form of private investment yeah. uh that you have uh, another one which kind of is a little bit different but um it's called venture capital right so venture capital is just private money i have a hundred dollars got a thousand dollars got hundred thousand dollars where i'm going to invest in a new business um, and you know depending on the kind of venture capital it could be either a controlling position it could be a majority a minority position it could be in biotechnology it could be in technology uh, but as a general matter these are really kind of early stage on average uh, though not exclusively and you know generally in, in new kinds of, of ventures the third bucket is private equity now that's kind of the world that i sit in um, that's a little bit different from venture capital, though there is some intersection between the two of them. Um, where they differ is, you know, there's private equity firms like ours that focus on really, really small firms. Uh, and then, you know, there's private equity funds that, you know, focus on bigger ones. There are private equity firms that focus, they're very sector specific. So it could be healthcare, it could be technology. Um, you know, and then there's also a differentiation of whether we're just writing a check and just hoping versus taking a controlling interest. Um, so that's that's like kind of private equity. Um, there's also the concept of private credit. Uh, again, there's various flavors of private credit where, so if you think about like the big, large publicly traded companies, they can easily access capital and they can do that by either going to their bank or by issuing uh, a paper in the, you know, in the public markets. But if you're like a small private company, you've got far fewer options. And so there's a whole bunch of private credit uh, kinds of options that are, that are available. And then, you know, another bucket could be uh, potentially real estate. Uh, and then again, lots of different uh, flavors. There's, you know, residential, there's commercial, um, you know, you could have strategies that are for income, you could have strategies which are for speculation. And then I would say like the final bucket, which is, you know, 
really esoteric, you know, um, as your tax liens, your securitized receivables, Medicare receivables, there are a lot of off the run yeah. stuff. And so the way I've kind of thought about these private investments over time, um, you know, and there is a debate over this, but for me, um, the stuff that I've looked in have historically been far less risky than the public stuff with far better risk reward profiles that isn't the case for all of them uh, type of thing. But the way I think about it is it belongs in your portfolio once you cross a certain threshold. Once you've paid yourself, you have no debt, yeah. you know, you've got a public markets kind of um, the thing that I love to think about the most is don't put all your eggs in one basket, right? And so I love diversification of all kinds. And that, you know, that you'll see that kind of in my equity investment. So I don't like making single stock um, investments. I like big baskets. I don't like to buy a government bond. I like to buy a big basket of government bonds. And so, um, yeah, it's the same thing within, you know, hedge funds. It's the same thing within credit and stuff like that. I just don't like having any form of concentrated risk. That is a, uh, controversial statements. Some people love having a uh, concentrated risk, but for my level of comfort, I would say that, you know, if you've gotten your net worth into the couple of millions of dollars, it's time to start thinking about some of these private investments. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there just to get Lori's perspective on this. I, I love how you talk about the, the bucket strategy. Um, I used to advise my clients, um, you know, based on their, not their risk reward, but their tolerance for risk, right? It's not only the, the, the length of time that they'll need to stay invested, but how much risk can they actually take? Um, and so, as you know, Morningstar has been a big proponent of, you know, these three buckets. Um, I use the same strategy uh, when I started looking at my portfolio. Um, I have my, what I call my retirement bucket. Right, so that if everything else goes away, or as the market uh, shows volatility, I know and I can uh, feel more comfortable that I still have my retirement nest egg, as we used to call it, um, set aside. Uh, and then I have, um, for me, because I am an investor um, by trade, I have my my picks. So I've invested directly into companies, mostly technology, although it started uh, when I started um, this portfolio, I looked at dividend growers um, because I wanted to, uh, this was right after the 2008 financial crisis. I wanted to invest in companies that I felt had the longevity. Um, and so I looked at the dividend growers there. And then just recently, what I did was I took my gains from um, my individual stock portfolio. And I'd had quite a few gains in two particular um, securities, Netflix and Apple. And I took those gains, kind of not all of them. I took those gains off the table and said, I am going to invest uh, X percentage of my portfolio in direct investments uh, into companies. And, uh, and that is, if that money goes away, if for some reason I lose it all, uh, I'm okay with that. So for me, it's, you know, if, if, I would, if I would spend, I don't know, $200,000 on a new home or $100,000 on a car, uh, which a car is not a really good investment anyway, uh, to me, that's kind of the throwaway money. So instead of buying a new car, I'm going to invest in, in private companies. Uh, I have chosen to do the private company route. Um, I did invest in the ArcView fund uh, only because the members of that fund, we actually do our own due diligence as a team. And then we recommend to other members and then we vote as a group. And so it was, in addition to the investment, it was my education into a sector that I knew very little about, which was legalized cannabis. Within uh, within your cannabis investment, what part did you, is it like on the growers? Is it on the distribution side, the retail side? Yep, so uh, I started approaching it first by saying I didn't really like the cannabis touching businesses. I just felt that um, there was too much risk 
in that area. Um, and so I was looking for ancillary businesses and uh, the fund invests across the board. So there I got to look at everything. Um, now I will say since then, I have invested in the, in the company I'm working with now, Village. Um, they are in the plant touching business. So they are fully integrated seed to sale business um, and I see now sort of the value of that and um, and the economics around owning the full supply chain. So it's been kind of across the board. How do you, Lori, how do you think about like kind of the asset allocation? So let's just suppose your marijuana investment goes like this. And now it represents a quarter of your portfolio. Yeah, like, well, actually the opposite was happening, Ron. So in March, yeah. I'm sitting at my uh, kitchen table and I'm watching CNBC and the rest of my portfolio was like this. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to be over allocated to marijuana. <laughs> um, so. So, yeah. So, you know, as as a institutional consultant, I actually um, lived this with one of my clients. Right. They had uh, they made allocation of about 25 percent of their portfolio um, to private equity. Uh, a big chunk of that was in timber, a uh, very illiquid asset. Um, and then meanwhile, the markets tanked. And so even though they had a 25% allocation, which was you know pretty big for a public pension plan, when you look at their obligations, uh, so the, the capital that had not yet been called, versus what was going on in the rest of the portfolio, they were over allocated, right? So if that were the case, um, there, there are secondary markets um, that you can sell into in times like that, but you don't wanna do that, right? Because then you're selling, um, you're selling into fear and you really wanna be buying into fear. <laughs> right. Lori, let's, let's just level. So let's start at the beginning. What threshold, give or take, and we're gonna hold you to a specific number, but what, what, what threshold should people start thinking about private um, allocations? Is it a million dollars in net worth? Is it 5 million? Is it 10 million? Well, as you know, you have to be an accredited investor to uh -huh. invest in a lot of these deals, which is a million dollars of net worth or 200,000 in or 200,000 for an individual, 300,000 um, for a couple. But I know a lot of broke $300,000 earners out there, right? So like we talked about, you can be making $300,000 a year, but you know, if something happens, you don't have enough money to take care of your basic needs. So I didn't start doing um, my, um, my illiquid portfolio until my liquid portfolio crossed a million dollars. Okay. And well, let's, let's, you know, let's go up. Like, I mean, so at some limit, there should be some percentage to the privates and some to the public. So clearly if your net worth is under a million, your allocation is zero. Where is your North star? Where do you want to get that number to eventually? Which number, the allocation or my total portfolio value? No, the allocation. Uh, so, okay, so, so here's where I jump in and I say, hold time out. No, I'm kidding. You can speak in general terms. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to put Lori's uh, portfolio fully out there for everyone. No, but I'm serious. I mean, this, these are really great questions. So I'm going to jump back out. But, you know, definitely feel free to, you know, talk in general terms. Um, yeah. Okay, I'm jumping out. Yeah, so... Um, so, you know, again, I think once you get into this arena, um, it becomes a time horizon, right? So if you want to allocate more in the private equity, and there are some people, as you know, Ron, that don't like the public markets at all. And they're 100%, <laughs> they're 100% invested in private markets. Um, and that's not to say that they're taking on more risk, because as you pointed out, a lot of times um, there are investments that will zig when the when the public markets zag. So um, and so that's what you want to do. But also the time horizon. Right. So, you know, if you feel like you've you have achieved enough to sustain yourself and your spouse 
in your lifetime, then you start to think about your children, right? Or that next generation. And then maybe you can take on a little bit more risk. Um, I don't have children. Uh, and so I am managing to my own expectation. Um, and what I did was I put a percent return target on my overall portfolio um, because I have a dollar amount um, that I want to try to achieve before I before I call it quits. So, um, OK, I mean, I think you, br you bring up a really, really good point, which is time allocations, right? So I know most private equity funds have got, you know, five to 10 year uh, holding periods. Whereas if you were to basically hold, uh, you know, have a stock portfolio type of thing, I mean, you could just hit sell uh, mm -hmm. and so forth. So like, how do you think about the duration of your assets? Like how much do you think should be short term, liquid, tied you over? And how are you thinking about kind of the longer term? Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. I, um, I, I definitely have cash put a, cash, um, put away and actually set aside outside of my quote unquote portfolio, uh, for emergencies. Uh, luckily even during this market, I haven't had to touch that cash. So knock on wood, I, you know, I didn't have to worry about that, but I think that bucket, if you will, um, in these times, you know, people used to say when I started out in the business, you have to have six months worth of, you know, savings. Well, I actually think as you get older, especially you need closer to two years, right? Okay. Because if you think about if you're out of your, uh, if you're out of the market in terms of a job, it could take up to two years, especially what we're seeing today to get back into an earning position. So I think two years is kind of that. That's why you know, keeping your expenses down. And, um, and then on my, on my outside of my retirement assets, um, you know, I, I do have somewhat of a shorter duration, right? So I have kind of this, I would say more of a 10 year look. Um, and that maybe is more of a litmus test for what types of investments that I invest in. If I think back on it now, uh, my real estate, um, you know, even real estate um, that I've done directly, um, you know, is really trying to earn back at least my principal within 10 years. Uh, another thing that I did last year, which I think is worth noting because it is something that may or may not go away, is opportunity zone investing. And um, I did take, like I said, money from Netflix, which, you know, I'm up 600% on that position. Um, and put it into an opportunity zone development in Los Angeles. And what that does basically is defer my taxes, if not eliminate the taxes, depending on my holding period. Um, so I think 10, you know, to answer your question, that 10 year hold for my market um, portfolio is not by design, but I think what in my mind I'm using is sort of that interim number. How do you think about, um you know, as you're like kind of putting the pieces together, like the way I think about my assets is that they should be uncorrelated. Um, do you, and so for me, it's more than an expected return. If I want to add something, it's got to be uncorrelated to what I uh, you know, already own type of thing. Yeah. And so like to me, I'm like doing less of like, what is the risk reward and more of like, okay, I want a bunch of lines that are going upwards and to the right but I want them to go upwards and to the right in an uncorrelated fashion yeah. so that when one is going down, the other one is going up. How do you think about that incremental investment? Is it based on correlation? Is it based on risk? Is it based on return? How do you think about it? Um, you know, I have to be honest with you. I have not thought about correlations in the way that let's say an institution would think about it. I don't think the average person does, I, you know, if, if at all, I might look at correlations as it relates to return, but that isn't what you should be looking at. You should be looking at the risk, right? Um, and so I haven't really factored that into my asset allocation, um, but I'm willing to take a little bit more risk, right? So for me, um, 
you know, if, if everything is down at the same time, um, I'm okay with that again, because I've built it in such a way that, um, even if my risk is, so even the things that are, um, oversold or really out of the market, um, you know, I, I would be okay. Lori, that's interesting because your perspective is about 180 degrees different from mine. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know what? I would say, Ron, the average person doesn't think about the correlation of their of their investments. Right. They don't think yeah. that, you know, oh, no, I, I will say that I do look at um, the percent allocated. Right. So, um, you know, for example, I'll use the, this pri the private deals that I've been working on. You know, if it gets to the point where I feel like I'm over allocated or I have enough in there, then I will stop. But it has less to do with how the investments sort of um, um, how they sort of interact with one another at any given point in time. I'd be curious to know, though, as, a, as an individual now that I don't know, you might have a Bloomberg behind you, but uh, as an individual, how are you measuring those correlations and how do you monitor that? So, I mean, uh, it's a really it's a tough it, it, it's a tough answer without trying to get overly technical. <laughs> but if your assets are going up together and down together, then you you don't have you don't you have one asset. You may think you have 10 assets. You may think that you're diversified. You are not. Mm -hmm. and, and so like that to me is troublesome. And so I try to basically create a portfolio that goes up over time uh, and where the assets are just uncorrelated for one another. And so I think now might be actually like a really good time to just level set again. And so let's just take the example of Microsoft as an example, right? So to the average person, Microsoft sells an operating system. And if they sell a really good operating system, the stock should go up. And if they sell a really bad operating system, the stock should go down. Uh, unfortunately, that's actually not at all how it works. So Microsoft uh, has a lot of attributes, right? It is a large company. It has a dividend. It is a technology company. Um, it has very low volatility. And so lots of people are buying this company for lots of different reasons, completely unrelated to what you think it does. Okay. And so what will happen is, is that each stock that you purchase has got sy systematic risk and those systematic factors are all correlated, whether that's Microsoft, General Electric or Exxon. Yeah. And so what Citadel and hedge funds are designed are able to do is there's good cholesterol and there's bad cholesterol. The bad cholesterol is things you have no view on, right? So I have no idea when value is going to do better than growth. I have no idea when dividend payers are going to outperform non-dividend payers. I don't have a view on any of those things. And so there are ways to kind of extract all of that. And then what you're left with is idiosyncratic. Now something that's idiosyncratic from Home Depot to Exxon, yeah. those assets, if you can control and get rid of the systematic stuff, th then, then you're starting to flip the coin thousands of times in an independent kind of way. Yeah. If all you own is just stocks and bonds, you literally own one asset. Yeah. I try to keep it simple though. Right? Yeah. So, so I do, um, you know, I do look at like where we are today, right? And, you know, if we are in a recession, which, you know, probably 99% of the economists out there say that we are, then what are the areas of the economy that we want to be in because they look relatively cheap? Now, yes, um, you know, they might react in the same way, but I, 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 as an investor, as an individual investor, without the help of an advisor, uh, without the help of a, of a fund manager, it's hard for me to measure that. So I just really kind of look at, okay, you know, what is going to sustain through a double dip recession? What is going to happen if we, if we go into a depression? I don't so I won't say depression. that. Right. So Laura, <laughs> Laura, you're making it lasts for five years. Um, yeah, Laurie, you're making my point for me. 
which okay. is if, if, you're, if you're in the right privates, you should be agnostic of whether the economy is going up or down. Your investment should pay you no matter what. And yeah. so there are a lot of various investments that you can make, which would make you ag agnostic to how the business, because look at, I, you know, I've got a graduate degree in economics. I was on Wall Street for 20 years, paid to do this. And like my edge is maybe a little bit more than the next person, but it's really hard to know when is the economy going to do this? When is it going to do this? What is the Fed going to do yeah. up or down type of thing? And so the investments that I like to make, for example, go up all the time, no matter what. And so you can almost think about a lot of these private investments like you would think of a U.S. Treasury. You're going to get paid every quarter or, or every year because it's designed that way. And so hedge funds that basically are long one asset, short another, mm -hmm. okay. they don't care how the market does. It's just so long as Home Depot does better than Lowe's, yeah. you're going to do well. And so if you can collect those assets in your portfolio, you're going to materially de-risk the portfolio relative to a yeah. public securities portfolio. So Ron, let me ask you, I mean, um, a lot of hedge funds have very high minimums, right? And so how yeah. does the average, uh, in, average accredited investor or average investor um, invest in a way to sort of take advantage of that? Well, so in this specific instance, I'm obviously, you know, I'm only familiar with Citadel. So that's very hard because <laughs> the average person can't get into Citadel. So that's probably not the best example. But you know, the firm that I currently work with right now, we buy really small businesses at four times earnings and we hold these things for 10 years. And so, you know, your yields on day one are probably close to 30%. So there's a lot of margin of safety. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of those kinds of vehicles kind of out there. And so like, it's possible that you can't get your hedge fund exposure that you need, but there are other forms of alternative investments like tax liens is a, is a fantastic example, which is literally for small investors. Again, let's like level set of what a tax lien is. I have a house, if it's worth $100, I owe the government every year, two years of property tax. Yeah. Okay. If I don't pay the property tax, the state is going to basically auction my house and the starting bid is $2 because they have to get paid their taxes. Right. And so a lot of these tax liens will end up getting sold at around 30, $35 in this example. And, you know, most people don't want to lose their house and they're like, oops, I forgot to pay my bill. And you get your money back with a nice interest payment like that. And if you don't, then, you know, you own an asset, which is worth a hundred at 30, $35. Yeah. So there are all these other various kinds of private investments out there where you, you can build huge margin of safety and not have to kind of worry about the 30, 40, 50% drawdowns. Like I am really averse to losing money. So, um, <laughs> you know, and then the other answer to your question is there's obviously options, um, you know, like derivative contracts of so calls and puts and stuff like that, which can always limit your downside and always kind of keep you really within a box of what your what ex acceptable risk is. So I guess the long story short is, is um, you know, the more net worth that you have, the more access you will have to various vehicles type yeah. of thing, and the more you're going to be able to diversify yourself. Yeah. The, um, what, the one thing though that we're not talking about is the time to do that, right? And so it wasn't until I stopped working um, you know, a full-time job that I felt like I really had the time to pay attention to that. Um, and so that's where, you know, sometimes even people that have the time don't have the proclivity to really um, take the time to learn. Um, I think what we're seeing a lot, not, not everything, but a lot of what we're seeing in the market um, from March to today is because people are home more and they are paying more attention to stuff like this. So day trading has come back um, big time. So, <laughs> well, Laurie, I would say two things to that. Uh, one, the emergence, the emergence of RIA, uh, those are registered mm -hmm. investment advisors. A lot of those have got access to these kinds of strategies that that I'm talking about. So instead of going to a Morgan Stanley or a Schwab, that's just only going to show you plain vanilla stuff you can easily go to an ria and they're they've got a big buffet yeah. of different things so that's like my first observation yeah my second observation and this is something that i learned um literally almost first day kind of on the job is like if you're going to work 60 to 80 hours a week right 
the next question you want to ask yourself, well, how, how hard should you work on like thinking about what to do with your savings? The answer is not spend no hours and no minutes on this type of thing. The answer is like, you, if you want your money to work for you, you, you got to carve out the time every single week, you know, to be thinking about your portfolio, to be thinking about those kinds of new investments. And here's the great thing. There are a ton of resources online. So like 25, 30 years ago, I had no idea that any of these things, you couldn't research them. RIAs barely kind of existed. And so the really nice thing is today, should you decide that you want to put privates into your portfolios, you not only have access to RIAs, there's a lot of stuff online. Plus, and we haven't even like spoken about this, but there's a lot of crowdfunding sites. Yeah. Whether, oh yeah, you know, and so there's plenty of opportunity for people to kind of get into a lot of these things. It may not be Citadel, and that's that's fine. Uh, but there are a lot of other really great, uh, fantastic investments out there that have got really great risk reward. I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've I found um, that even wealthy people, when I was a uh, private wealth manager even wealthy people felt that they didn't really understand this stuff. So um, having someone, like you said, an RIA to not only look at their investment portfolio, but look at their overall wealth strategy, uh, especially important for entrepreneurs, because again, a big part of their portfolio is their company, right? And how much risk are they taking in their own company? So I have an example of a good friend who has a private equity uh, shop. And when I was at uh, Credit Suisse, I tried to sell him uh, private equity or hedge fund uh, funds that we had. And he was like, I already take all my risk in my, you know, sell me some government bonds. <laughs> so I think, you know, having an RIA that sort of looks, you know, helps an entrepreneur look at their overall wealth strategy is really, really important. Um, I, I actually do have an advisor. Um, even you know, even though I have experience, I have an advisor that I met along the way, um, only because I had inherited some stock that had to be at a firm. And then you know, here he is, here's my new best friend, right? Um, and I don't really use him to. Um, I, I use him for advice, but I use him more to validate some of my um, uh, some of my decisions because as you know behavioral biases play into everything we do and I saw that firsthand with my clients you know who would not sell you know in 2000 when the tech stocks were falling they wouldn't sell because they they fell in love with their losers and so I do use an advisor even though I I have experience and I feel like I am a sophisticated investor. Um, I, I use him and I use him for that reason. Yeah, I think one thing worth articulating is that if you own a business and your assets are stuck in kind of one place, keep in mind that there is some tax arbitrage there, right? Because your corporate income tax is far lower than your personal income tax. And so for every dollar your business makes, you know, you're you're keeping 80 cents, but once that becomes income, you're keeping maybe half of it. And so you kind of also have to sit and think about that, those after tax returns relative to, I, you know, you could liquidate some of that, put it elsewhere type of thing, but then your after tax returns are going to look a lot different. And, and, and certainly if your business is a good business, it's kind of a well-run business type of thing, you know, maybe it's not necessarily such a bad thing to have your money in the business. But again, I would say the holy grail is to have uncorrelated assets and to not have all your eggs in one basket. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting you mentioned crowdfunding because the deal that the uh, Opportunity Zone deal that I did was actually through Cadre. Um, and Cadre, the reason I chose um, that platform to use is because the introduction or their use of AI in selecting what regions, what cities, what zip codes offer the greatest opportunity. How much has technology outside of the, the Citadel world, who's you know known for using technology to make uh, decisions and strategic shifts, um, how much do you think that investors should really be looking at uh, if they are outsourcing, 
um, how their manager or their wealth manager, portfolio manager are using tools like that in their portfolio. Okay, so that's a really complex question. So I, I think I'd like to answer it at 50,000 feet. So um, a typical mutual fund can charge, give or take 1% of the assets. And they use that 1% for everything as it pertains to research, everything as it pertains to travel and so forth, okay? A typical hedge fund will charge 2% and then also 20% of the profits. That mutual fund is competing against that hedge fund, okay? So if you have two and 20, you have a lot more resources than if you only have one. Mm -hmm. And then you have a whole subgroup of other hedge funds, which basically have something called a cost pass-through. So there's about five to 10 of them where those guys have an infinite budget. And those guys have got access to data, they've got access to technology and so forth. Because of that, my advice to pretty much anybody who will ask me is you should just index don't think about a mutual fund. Don't think about a hedge funds because those big guys have got that technology advantage. Don't even bother trying. In other industries, whether that's private equity or venture capital, they may not have a be nearly as sophisticated as say some of the hedge funds, but for sure it's the case that these guys are, are definitely using a technology. To the average person that's listening to this, I can't emphasize this enough. Don't ever own stocks, just index type of thing. Just keep it simple. These are very liquid investments. I love the idea. The concept of outperforming the market is a beautiful idea. It just doesn't happen. And after fees, you're just going to basically um, end up losing. So you might as well just have one big spider ETF and you might have an aggregate bond and it's just simple. It's easy. Um, and like from my vantage point, you're going to end up being far further along than if you entrust your Morgan Stanley broker to say, put you in this mutual fund over here. Uh, and that particular stock over there, as best I can tell, there are very few people that can do that systematically, particularly with the very small budget. Yeah, I would put a little asterisk around that um, because there are some hard to, um, you know, hard to invest in asset classes um, where you have to go into, uh, well, now I guess, there's so many index funds out there. You know, I guess you can you can sort of find that one. Um, you know, but I'll use cannabis as as a great example. Um, you know, there are some cannabis um, indices that are traded on the Canadian stock exchange, but even there, it's really hard to get access to. So um, I agree with you. I, I have historically done all um, ETFs or index funds, um, you know, where where uh, active management, I felt, uh, didn't make sense. Uh, but in my retirement portfolio, um, I recently moved all of that into a managed account and a separately managed account. Now, they are investing directly um, into... Uh, into stocks in the SMA. Um, basically, I've outsourced that decision making to a professional, right? At fees that are less than one percent, right? So there's no, you know, embedded fee and no one on top of that fee. You know, I wanted to make sure that whatever I did, I kept my fees down because I think that is an important point you make. Fees will. Um, will eat into your portfolio um, to the point where you think you're doing well, but when you start to look at your performance or your returns, net of fees, it really, net of fees and net of taxes to your point, uh, it really makes it very difficult to sort of beat the market. Yeah, Lori, I, I think it's one thing I need to clarify there. As I said, there are Ferraris and Lamborghinis and there are Hondas and Hondas are fine type of thing, but uh, you know, I know Citadel used to charge, you know, very big fees, but they would produce really big returns type of thing. And so like I wouldn't use a hard fast rule of like if it's more than X percent of the asset, it's a no. Uh, or similarly, if it's below X, you know, a number of one percent type of thing, it's a yes type of thing. I think you really have to do due diligence and figure out what, what are those fees being used for? Are they going directly into the manager's pocket? Or are they being used for research, development type of thing, uh, travel and, and, and so forth, technology and so forth. So to me, yeah. technology is really um, 
not from an advisor perspective, but from a decision-making perspective. I think technology, and people can understand this, um, artificial intelligence, which has been around for a long time, has just gotten so much cheaper that um, even a portfolio manager, not of a big size of Citadel, can utilize and leverage some of the machine learning and uh, distillation of information at you know pennies on the dollar versus ten years ago. Uh, so, so you know, back to my point, that is why I chose um, uh, Cadre um, as that sort of crowdfunding platform that um, that I invested with. Yeah, there are a lot of crowdfunding uh, websites out there where you could be making loans, credit card loans, like a refinancing people, like I think of a lending club. You have uh, crowdfunding where um, there are companies out there that need some, to borrow money for their inventories um, and, you know, and so forth and so forth type of thing. And that's like a clever way to kind of get higher yield because right now interest rates are really, 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 really low. But in the private markets, you could still get double digit yields type of thing. Again, you know, like when I've put my portfolios together, we're talking originating hundreds of loans, different parts of the country and, uh, and so forth, and not not to one person, uh, the municipality of Chicago is an example type of thing. Like uh, I, I'm a huge fan of diversification. And mm -hmm. to your point, a lot of these crowdfunding um, websites have got really fantastic tools, technology tools yeah. to help you assess the risk. Yeah. Um, oh, oh. <laughs> I was, I was, I was going to ask another question, but I, maybe we're out of time. No, we're not. <laughs> Keep talking. We're good. <laughs> so I mentioned that there are other uh, asset classes that are hard to access. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned one, which are the um, the tax lien. Um, what are some others that that the average investor? I've got my pen out now. I'm going to write these down um, right now at this moment. Should be looking at. Well, I, I think should be looking at and and what is esoteric type of thing or perhaps two very different kinds of things. So, I, but um, you know, there are all different kinds of mezzanine debt uh, funds out there. Um, you know, and they basically make loans to small businesses at and you know, some instances you can get some warrants. And so, the return and risk profiles tend to be really really good. Um, you, you know, to those kinds of investments you know i'm sure uh sadia might know somebody that you know dabbles in art that's kind of not my cup of tea but you know kind of like in a world where money's free and there's kind of a lot of liquidity it's you know kind of seeping you know kind of down um what about you know crypto? everyone everyone's talking about crypto now and no, i know zero yes <laughs> zero, like literally put this much into cryptocurrency yeah. zero and and ron has you know um, has shared some of those reasons um, with me. And I, I jumped back up because as you guys were talking about other asset classes and, and access or, you know, when you brought up crowdfunding, I thought about the film industry, right? Mm -hmm. How risky it is and people generally aren't putting their, their money there. And you have to be an accredited, um, you know, investor, um, generally, and it, it depends on what the raise is, but generally, you know, you have to have at least, you know, a million, I think it's a million liquid yeah. looking at. Yeah. So um, one of the things that I wanted to touch base on, considering that, you know, the CCE represents, you know, nine industries of the creative industries, mm -hmm. um, whether that's investing in film projects or music projects or technology that's wrapped around mm -hmm. some of these um um, industry. So I just wanted to put that out there really quick. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, there are there are funds out there. Sorry, Lori. There are funds out there that uh, where if you wanted to buy or at least invest in, um, you know, music royalties that that exists. There are really interesting things kind of around buying uh, YouTube sites. You can do that, um, and then you, you put some advertising on those YouTube sites. So again, the, like there is really kind of no shortage of really innovative things that are taking yeah. place right now in the world of finance, which are completely off the run. Um, some will pay you a monthly, you know, income or dividend, and others are kind of more uh, longer term. Yeah, I think at the end, I think at the end of the day, what's important is 
invest in what you know and what interests you because then you will find the time to do the research right and and for creatives you know whether they are in film or music or in visual arts um, there are opportunities for them to take their knowledge and to invest in the technologies or invest in that that area of the industry that is quote unquote private or alternative like um, that, you know, they would probably have an easier way of understanding. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. Um, one of my partners um, brought something to my attention, which is storage for art. Well, the storage, <laughs> the uh, storage industry as a whole is another big industry like manufactured housing. So, you know, one of the uh, other companies that I work with is a, um, a company that does only manufactured housing. Um, we buy loans and leases to Ron's point, uh, but it, we also develop new communities or buy existing communities and expand and, and improve on them. Um, and so the, the, the storage market is a very similar to that uh, because to Ron's point, the storage, um, I forget what they call it, like off-premise storage, basically, um, zigs when the rest of the market zags, right? If the economy is doing poorly and people start to downsize, um, those tend to do better in terms of um, uh, uh, being fully rented um, versus uh, some other asset classes. So that's another asset class that is not specific to art, but uh, something that I think artists can understand very well. Well, yeah, but I mean, the actual places that collectors are storing their art. Yeah. Yeah, you get it. I mean, it's it's just, it's one of those things where people don't really think about that and investing in more of those. Yeah. Um, so, Sadia, yeah. Sadia. Yes. You know, I have one very strong recommendation for anybody who wants to learn about private investing. There are two fantastic website, um, sorry, podcasts. One is called Invest Like the Best. The Best uh, Like the Best. Invest Like the Best by Patrick O'Shaughnessy. And the other one is called Capital Allocators. Okay. Uh, and that's Ted Seides. Those two are fantastic. Here's the punchline. For every podcast that you listen to, if you want to get more information about any one of those strategies, you literally, it is amazing. It's an amazing community. You just, you write them an email saying, I listened to your podcast. It was so interesting. I want to learn more about your strategy. Can we set up time to chat? And that's how I started to get smart on all of this stuff. Again, all of this information is just readily available to pretty much everybody. And you'd be really kind of shocked and surprised at how many fantastic entrepreneurs there are out there in the world of finance that would love to kind of get to know you too. Yeah. Yeah. How about you, Lori? Any, um, I know you made a recommendation earlier um, about a book. Um, any other recommendations? <laughs> uh, well, I would just echo what Ron said. So yeah. if you do hear someone who, um, or listen to or read someone's uh, information or blog post, reach out to them. You'd be really surprised. So I was on a, a call. It was actually, I think, a Kellogg alumni call um, with, um, you know, with one of the founders from AQR and I reached out to him and just thanked him and he, he gave me his phone number. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, so I think people are, people are really accessible. And I tell you right now, because of Corona, yeah, people want to talk to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Well, funny enough, I'll circle back. I actually put uh, uh, in the comments, I meant to put in the private chat is does Ron want to have his phone number out there like that? And we realized it went out there. So for those of you who have a curiosity, I want to reach out to uh, Mr. Wexler. He has uh, put his information. So, um, you know, listen, this has been so informative. I mean, my heart is like, you know, palpitating because I'm over here getting excited about the possibilities of um, one, Lori, you mentioned something that Christine mentioned uh, in our earlier talk, which is that it's not about six months of savings anymore, right? It's maybe 18 months. And to your point, making it very specific with regards to time, yeah. um, I think COVID really woke us all up to the point of, okay, now what do we do? Because all of our uh, companies have halted. What do we live on? And what if the government didn't write everybody a check? You know, How do we make sure that we can take care of ourselves? So I appreciate that note and it's 
perfectly in sync with one of our other talks. And the other thing that you said, which is what Ron said, is pay yourself first, right? And the importance of that. And so, you know, we oftentimes as entrepreneurs, um, I sit as a director for CCE now, but I'm an inherent entrepreneur. I started my first business when I was nine years old, uh, Nature's Images by Saudia. And, uh, you know, my mom is an entrepreneur and my grandmother had two hair salons. So I come through a track of women entrepreneurs. And one of the things I think that's the hardest thing to do is to consider paying yourself first because you're thinking of the business first. Yeah. And Ron, I really appreciate you mentioning um, after tax returns, you know, really starting to understand it's great to have an idea around creating a company, but then how do you make it sustainable? And then how do you sustain yourself? Mm -hmm. And so much of what you guys talked about today, I think at any asset level um, is really relative. And I think the most important thing is I really wanted people to stretch that this three part series would be like, you know, start one, like Ron said, it's almost like compounding. And in the series, it was compounding. And you guys really took it to that next level. Um, so thank you so much. And I really appreciate your perspectives, albeit some of them different. I'm really interested in this really diversifying so only all of your assets go like this. All the time. <laughs> yeah, we might have to do it. Everybody number. is. <laughs> Right. right. So listen, you guys, thank you so much again for your time. Is there anything else you want to say before we jump off? Yeah, I'd like to say best of luck to everybody. And um, yeah, this has just been a lot of fun. Sadia, thank you so much for kind of organizing it. And um, Lori, it was great to meet you. You as well. Thank you. Thanks, Sadia. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Have a great weekend. All right. And, you know, save something. Don't spend it all at once. No, no. <laughs> thank you. It's such a pleasure to be able to bring to you um, individuals, experts in their day. Not necessarily experts all the time, but individuals who the guidance that they can provide hopefully will provide um, some insight in your life. The wisdom that they have shared hopefully will help you make better decisions. We are all in this together and we are all trying to find ways to do things better. I think if anything, COVID has, like I said, it's uh, provided insight in this 2020 year um, of, of ways to do things different. So continue to innovate, continue to do your art and think a little bit more about uh, not only paying yourself, but the value of that dollar oh wait you guys okay that's my penny necklace why because every cent counts have a great weekend i'm saudia davis we'll see you next week take care <laughs>